will, take your Bibles and let's go back to Proverbs. We've been in a study in Proverbs, looking at Solomon's Proverbs that he shared with his children. We come to chapter 5, and again, verse 1, we see he's addressing my son. These are his instructions to his son. Chapter 5, and we're going to look into chapter 7 also, are mainly dealing with uh, talking to his children about sexual purity. He instructs his son about the strange woman. I guess when he talked to his daughters, he talked about the strange man or the dirty old man or whatever. But this is an area, folks, that we need to take some time to instruct our children. This is some very important information we need to impart. I read it at Kansas State University. They did a study some time back, and they took 110 college students, uh, ladies, trying to determine where these young ladies got their information about sex. They discovered it's mostly from friends, media, and school courses. Of the 35 items of information that they asked about, these young ladies only got two of these from their mother. Zero from dad. Dad had not talked to their daughters at all about these matters. I heard about one dad who decided he would set his young son down and talk to him about sex. He said, son, I think we need to have a little talk about sex. And he said, okay, dad, what do you need to know? That may be the way it is in a lot of homes. But I think all of us know we're in a mess today. When it comes to morality, uh, too many of our teenagers are getting their information from the wrong sources. They're getting it from Hollywood, from TV and movies. I read that the average teenager will have watched 2,500 hours of TV and it it portrays sex, four out of five scenes is unmarried couples involved in sex four out of five it's not about a husband and wife and so we've got to be careful that our young people don't get all they know about this from the wrong sources parents it's very important that we sit down and talk to them and show them the sexual boundaries that God has placed not only that not only talking to them, but I think we need to be involved in their lives. They say that families that eat their meals together and spend time together, that the children are more likely to listen to what their parents have to say. How many believe in sex education? Where should should this be? Should it be in public schools? Should it be in the home? What's Solomon doing? This is homeschooling right he's talking to his children about this matter and i think it's important that we do this uh i know some say well what you don't know can't hurt you you ever heard that what you don't know can't hurt you i disagree with that folks what you don't know can kill you especially when it comes to this subject too many people have brought a lot of misery upon themselves because of a lack of knowledge and understanding about these things. Who do we look to for this knowledge? Do we look to the humanistic professor? Do we look to the Bible-rejecting counselor at Planned Parenthood? Do we listen to them? Do we listen to the Hollywood producers? How about Oprah? Is she pretty reliable? She's not even on air anymore, is she? Is Dr. Ruth still around? Y'all remember Dr. Ruth? She once told a college crowd, she said to these college students, 
It's unrealistic for you to be expected to wait. Your libido is too strong. Well, I wonder if, if some young man just jumped up and dra- drug her off the stage and molested her. It's not his fault. His libido just kicked in, right? It's okay. That's how stupid this stuff is. And we need to go to the Word of God and see what it has to say. Solomon introduces this character he calls the strange woman. That word strange means not related to. It's got the idea of something outside the confines of marriage. The strange woman speaks of the seductive, immoral woman, and that speaks of the men also. It's the idea of sexual immorality. So let's look here in chapter 5, verse 3. He says, For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, look who he's talking to, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh to the door of her house. Lest thou give thine honor unto others, and thy years unto the cruel. Let strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. And thou mourn at the last, when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. Talking about diseases that come from immorality. And say, how have I hated instruction, and my heart despised reproof. Drop down to verse 18. He says, let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Talking about a deer. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times. Be thou ravished always with her love. Not with the strange woman. Let's think about tonight's. What the Bible has to say about purity and promiscuity. The culture today portrays this woman that Solomon is talking about, the seductive woman and the seductive man. On television, in the movies, they're always portrayed as being glamorous, classy, flirty. They're made to look desirable, aren't they? You know, a lot of the sitcoms today, I I remember when I was growing up, pornography was really looked down upon. That was disgusting. You ever notice how they talk about it today? That's something very acceptable. And it's okay to get involved in pornography. It's okay to hire a prostitute. There's nothing wrong with that. And our children are being raised, if the television is their babysitter, this is what they're being taught. And they are being corrupted by this culture. We'd better take some time to show them the truth of these matters. Solomon, basically, there's two things he wants us to consider in what he says in Proverbs. First of all, he exposes sexual promiscuity. He says we've got to acknowledge, first of all, sexual immorality is seductive. The strange woman pictures sexual immorality. He talked back in verse 3 about how they talk and the words of temptation. Oh, honey lips, she knows how to entice and seduce. Look over in chapter 7. Let's, let's read some of this. in Proverbs chapter 7, beginning with verse 6. Talking to his children about this, he says, For at the window of my house I looked through my casement and beheld among the simple ones 
I discerned among the youth a young man void of understanding. Passing through the street near her corner, and he went away to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night, behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and subtle of heart. Hey, Christian ladies, don't dress like a harlot. You know, this world ought to be able to look at our ladies and see that's a Christian. And the clothing is getting more and more seductive and immodest. And too many of our ladies are getting caught up in this. Amen. I know it's summertime. I hate summertime. Because I've got to walk around with my eyes closed all the time. Because of all the immodesty that's out there. And a lot of these women who profess to be Christians have no conviction about modesty. These tight tights that they're wearing today. There is nothing left of the imagination, girls. And, and Christian women shouldn't be out dressed like that. Now, you say, I'm mad at you already. What's going to get worse? I'm just warming up. Look what he says here. Verse 11, she's loud and stubborn. But when it comes to dress, a lot of them are stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. So she called him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and I found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I perfumed my bed with myrrh and alloys and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with lust. Seduction. Enticing. And it's not just the women. The men are worse than the women. About trying to seduce others. Let's indulge our sexual appetite. Hey, it's only natural. These desires we have, they're from God. Let's not fight it. There's always that enticement, that seductive nature of illicit sex. There's something, I guess, exciting and exhilarating about this. Here's how it happens. Here, here's a wife. She's bored. She goes to work, and the guys at work flirt with her. They show interest in her. They, they compliment her looks and how she dresses. And she gets excited about that because, hey, it's been a long time since husband talked like that about these things. He's not showing any interest. The guys at work, they're showing interest. Right? Here's a guy at the office. And the sweet young thing comes around flirting, making suggestive comments. He begins to have thoughts of adultery in his heart. He begins to think, well, why not? Everybody else is doing it. Hey, girls, I, I wish we had a bunch of teenage girls here tonight. Matt, you might want to share this with them next time you get a chance. Girls... Don't let a boy talk you into doing something you're going to regret for the rest of your life. Learn how to respond to their seduction. Let me give you some examples. He says, if you love me, you'd let me. Here's what you say, girls. You say, if you loved me, you wouldn't want to use me. Because that's all they want to do. They say real men are sexually active. You say, well, my dog is too. They say, everybody's doing it. You say, no, I'm not. Godly Christians are not doing it. He says, well, I won't get you pregnant. You say, that's right, because you're not laying a hand on me. You say, he says, well, if you don't, I'll find somebody else. You say, goodbye and good riddance, jerk. 
Are y'all writing this down? If he says, well, you owe me for all the money I've spent on you, you say, well, I'll tell you what, let me go get my dad, and you tell him how much he owes for taking out his daughter. By the way, dating is not biblical. The idea of young men and young women going out unchaperoned on a date is unbiblical. In the Bible, courtship is the idea. There's always adult supervision. No girl would ever be date raped if dad was alone. That never happened. It's, it's unbiblical, it's dangerous. Listen, a person pressures somebody into sex not because he loves her. No, he does because he loves himself. And he's trying to satisfy his lustful desires. It's seductive. Number two, it is addictive. Back in chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. He shall die without instruction, and in the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. Now, we use the word sexual addiction. In a sense, I don't like that term because it kind of implies that that person is not responsible. But there is... On the other side, the fact that it is addictive. Pornography is addictive. People get caught up in pornography, and there is a strong addiction to this thing. Hey, it's flooding our nation. It's, flood, it's coming into our homes through the Internet and TV and many media sources. Young people have easy access to it. And people that get involved in it, become addicted to it and enslaved by it. That's what he's talking about, the cords, holding with the cords of these sins. You've got to be careful, folks. So easy to get caught up in this. Sometimes men get caught up in the idea of having a one-night stand. But I'm going to just do this one time and then never again. Doesn't usually work that way, does it? One time leads to another and to another. Jesus said, Whoso committed sin is the servant of sin. John 8, 34. You become a slave to it after a while. By the way, sexual immorality, you know, this is not a sin that we're told to fight. No, the Bible says this is a sin from which to flee. Don't stand and fight it. Get away from it. 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee fornication. 2 Timothy 2, 22, flee also youthful lust. Get away from it. Get away from such people. Get away from the books, the magazines, the websites, the movies that will draw you into that culture. Flee. Run. Is that what Joseph did? When Mrs. Potiphar came trying to seduce him, he did the, he, he did the biblical thing. He ran. He got out of there. And that's what we're, we're told to do. Flee fornication. Flee adultery. Number three, it's destructive. Very destructive. Despair comes with this. Of course, there have been millions of abortions because of immorality. Young couple, not married, going to have a baby. They say, well, we just won't have the baby. Wrong. You've already got the baby. Now you're going to decide whether to kill it. You've got the baby. It's there. Now what are you going to do with it? Despair can set in. It destroys homes and it destroys peace of mind and, and well-being. Folks, it always has that hook in it. 
All the bait the devil has, there's a hook in that bait somewhere. The one night stand, that little flirtation that gets out of hand, the addiction to pornography, it drags you into the sewers of sin. Then you've got people trying to pay out money behind the scenes to hide their sin or to feed their sin, money that they're taking from their families. It brings despair. Secondly, it brings disease. He talks about the disease that comes with this. The sexually transmitted diseases in this country are at an epidemic level. Every day, another disease. Ten prostitutes were interviewed. They all had herpes. It was estimated that they had infected over a thousand men. One of them, when asked about that, she said, well, we ain't running no convent here. We ain't running no convent here. This is a brothel. I'm going to tell you something, folks. We could stamp out VD completely. If everybody would live by this book, it would stamp out completely all venereal diseases. It would stamp out all pregnancy out of wedlock. All we've got to do is just obey God's word. And it would take care of all the problems we see in our culture today. A young man was at the mall and he, he met an old man in a wheelchair and they began to talk. The old man said, you know, are you, he said, are you a good mathematician? So I want to give you an equation. Fifteen minutes of stolen pleasure with a girl on the border and a lifetime of being a cripple in a wheelchair. Is that equal? He said, son, be sure your sins will find you out. There's despair, there's disease. Then there's disgrace. You see in verse 14, people get caught up in this, there's public disgrace. If you're a child of God, a member of a church, you bring disgrace upon your church and upon your Savior. Shame and disgrace. You bring it upon your family. Remember what Nathan told David when he had had an illicit affair with Bathsheba, tried to cover it up. When it finally was exposed, he, he said, David, you have given the enemies of God an occasion to blaspheme. This lost world ridicules our God when we live this way. How often you hear of preachers being exposed for sin in their life, sexual sin. Sometimes they, they look at some preacher that has fallen and they say, oh my, look how far he fell. Well, maybe not. You don't know how low he was living. Maybe he didn't fall that far after all. Look at chapter 6 in Proverbs. Verse 32 and 33. But he so committeth adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He that doeth it destroys his own soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. The shame and embarrassment that is brought upon your family and friends and loved ones. When people are exposed, of these things. I heard about a woman went to her pastor. She was telling her pastor that her husband had left her and the kids for another woman. She had one of her little boys with her when she was talking to the pastor. The pastor said that little boy sidled up to him, tears in his eyes. 
he said, Preacher, why doesn't Daddy love us anymore? What do you say? What do you say to that? Why doesn't Daddy love us anymore? Why would he leave us? Run off with another woman. Daddy said, I deserve to be happy. Well, what about his family? What do they deserve? Don't they deserve to be happy too? I, I'm trying to preach from my heart tonight, folks, because I'm burdened about this. I'm tired of seeing it in our churches. I'm tired of Matt and I and, and Cliff and getting up here and preaching and preaching and preaching, and it doesn't seem to make any difference at all to some people. They excuse it, they condone it. We're living in a day and time when many couples live together outside of marriage. Act like there's nothing wrong with it. Many of their parents condone it, and they shouldn't. Don't condone your children living a moral lifestyle. It's wrong. And they need to hear mom and dad say it's wrong. Second thing he wants to talk about to his children is to encourage sexual purity. In chapter 5, verses 15 through 17, he talks about the beauty of purity. Drink waters out of thine own cistern, running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad, rivers of waters in the street. Let them be only thine own, not strangers with thee. God gave us this. He says, keep it within the marriage, and it's a beautiful thing. Intimacy between a man and his wife kept within the bounds of marriage is a beautiful thing. Folks, it's only when it gets outside the bonds of marriage that it becomes an ugly thing. It becomes something corrupted and contaminated. No sex is like fire. Fire can either be constructive or destructive, right? Under control, fire can warm your house, it can heat your water, it can cook your food out of control it can burn your house down I just mentioned my cousin in Arkansas his daughter the mobile home caught fire and the baby was burned over half her body a little 14 month old baby fire can be very destructive sex within marriage is a good thing but outside of marriage, it becomes an ugly thing. See, Satan loves to take the good things God gives us and corrupt them. That's what he does. He corrupts that which was meant to be good and holy. So we note the beauty of it. And we, I think we ought to note the spirituality of it. It said in verse 18, Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Don't be looking at other women. I rejoice with the wife of my youth. Betty and I got married. We were pretty young. I was 23. She was 19. Married a teenager. We grew up together after we got married. We grew up together. I thank God for my wife. I thank God for a Christian home. Hey, I wouldn't trade my Christian home for anything the world has to offer. Now, I bet you I've had our disagreements, but I've learned to see things her way. And we get along really good now. But really, I think there's something deeply spiritual in a marriage relationship. God says that husband and wife come together and become one. One. 
not just physically, but spiritually. There's something beautiful about a Christian couple devoted to one another. They consummate their marriage. Now, even if mistakes have been made, you know, we can claim the forgiveness of the Lord. We can claim the cleansing power of the blood of Christ. If you've been guilty of sexual sin, repent of it and forsake it. Repent involves forsaking. Repent of it and forsake it. Get away from it. Years ago, Red Book Magazine did a study with 100,000 women. According to this study, they found a definite relationship between intimacy and religious commitment. Something they weren't expecting to find. Those who were devoted to God and this book had a better sex life. I know that word bothers some of you, the S word. When I was growing up, I don't think I ever heard a preacher use that word. But that's where we're at, right? It doesn't shock anybody anymore. But the relationship between a, a husband and a wife is a spiritual one. Then it's, I want you to note the chastity of it. You parents, you want your children to marry the right person, don't you? Where are they going to meet the right person? Now, if I say, now, Shelby, I want you to marry the right person, you, you need to go to the bar, you need to go to some nightclub, and see if you can find you a good man. No, I wouldn't do that, would I? You might find them on the Internet, but I'm not sure that's the best place to look. Where do you look? Where do you find a good, godly Christian man or woman? Hey, if you're looking for that kind of person, would you not say that that person is also looking for that? You're looking for a good, godly mate, and that person's looking for a good, godly mate? Who brought... Who brought Adam his wife? God brought Eve to Adam, right? Young people, let God bring the right person to you. Now, don't get impatient and run ahead of him. I know sometimes you get impatient. Uh, it's like the, the single lady that went to her pastor and, and said, you know, Pastor, I, I want to get married. I just want to get married so badly. And he said, well, now keep in mind that God's in charge of this. It's God's plan, one woman, one man for one lifetime. And, and you just you can't improve on God's plan. She said, I'm not trying to improve on it. I just want to get in on it. Well, be patient. Be willing to wait for that special person. Hey, and when that special person comes, don't you want to be morally and sexually pure to give yourself to that special person? And that person give themselves to you. A young woman who had lived a loose life and was bed hopping one person to another. She had a friend that was a young virgin and she had vowed to keep herself pure till her wedding night. She was kind of making fun of her little virgin friend. The virgin said, you know, I can become like you anytime I want, but you can never be like me again. And that's so true. The good news is we have a wonderful Savior. He died on the cross to pay our sin debt. We can be forgiven. And if you've been guilty of sexual sin, repent of it. Forsake it. Get, get away from the things that entice you. Be careful about what you look at, what you read. Make a covenant with your eyes. 
what you look on. Forsake it. Go and sin no more. If you're not saved, you can come to Christ tonight and find that forgiveness and that peace that only he can give.